Good. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you. I'd also like to thank all the speakers that preceded me. And I hope I can add to the sort of the foundation that they laid about thinking about the future. My presentation today is going to be very simple. I want to just talk about five innovations that we've identified at Treasury that I think hold promise across the whole federal financial landscape. But instead of talking in detail about the technologies, I really want to focus on the why question. Why did we pick these innovations? And what do we hope to achieve? And for each one of them, maybe identify a problem or two that we're encountering as we begin to roll it out. Um, this diagram always humbles me, and I hope it humbles you too. Whenever we talk about federal financial management, it's always important to remember that each federal agency is the size of a Fortune 100 company. Probably in terms of, if you compare outlays to revenue, and I think if you look at operational complexity, I think they probably stack up the same way. HHS, DOD, they're the size of, in fact, larger than Walmart or Exxon. A moderate-sized agency is the size of GM. FedEx is the same size as HUD. So this, I think, gives us a perspective that there are no easy answers, there are no silver bullets, and most importantly, as, as leaders who are thinking about the future, you have to have a long-term view. You really have to have a steady hand and a long-term goal about what you want to achieve. Uh, we're lucky because I think on the policy landscape, OMB has done, a, I think, a really fine job in identifying a variety of very clear cross-cutting objectives that, that really will shape the future. And if you look at all 13 of the, what they call the CAP goals, there are at least five of them that apply very directly to financial management. Data, data as a strategic asset. Improve the customer experience, the citizen experience. Share administrative services. Shift from low value to high value. And then, was talked about earlier, get payments right. Tackle that improper payments problem. I know Tim is going to talk about this. I don't want to just step on his toes. But again, this is a policy landscape that's very clear. Now, bring it closer to home, at, at Treasury, uh, we're really at, the, at a, really a critical point. We've just merged two agencies, two historical agencies, the Bureau of the Public Debt, the Financial Management Service. Those are now bound together into a single financial operation. We've realigned our, our, our partnership with the Federal Reserve to really focus our business. So what we did in light of that is earlier this year really come back with a vision. Where are we headed as an organization? And inspired by, by Hamilton, really got back to the foundation of public trust. What are we doing as Treasury to promote public trust? And really coming down to, to three public goods we're trying to always, always reinforce and create. To always be an efficient steward of taxpayer dollars. To, to always present accurate data Think about the financial reports issued by Treasury. Those have to be accurate. And then finally, all interactions, either making payments to citizens or receiving payments from citizens, make sure that, that customer service experience is modern, seamless, and secure. This is part of the vision we're talking about. Now let's jump ahead to the, the innovations. And of course, there, there are hundreds of innovations. Every day there's a new one. But in looking at the landscape, we've chosen to focus on these five. Uh, and again, with a very long-term view that these are things we should stay at for a number of years, develop expertise in these areas, and then hopefully spread that expertise, working in partnership with the federal agencies, spread that expertise across the landscape. And, and just to go down the list, and we're going to drill down on each one of them, RPA, we talked about that data analytics in a very specific sense, attacking the improper payments problem. And again, this sort of these two innovations very much focused at the efficient steward part of the public good. You can't have a meeting without talking about distributed ledger. And I think that's one that I think we could hold the promise to more accurate data. And then a common authentication, the whole idea of identity management, streamlining identity management, so that the customer experience is enhanced. And then throughout all of this, really move towards standard 
standards and common processes. How do we actually motivate this very large FM community to move in a common direction, to begin to achieve economies of scale through common processes? And again, this is probably more on the behavior and the, the human side of the equation, but I think of all the five, this is the one that I think is, is going to have the biggest impact. Now let's, let's start with the first one, RPA. What's the problem we're trying to solve? Workload's going up, staffing is going down. How do you handle that? We've discovered that uh, you know, RPA, that about 30% of our processes, looking at our end-to-end -end processes, at least 30% are either highly or totally automatable. In fact, um, probably closer to 50% is automatable in some form or fashion. So that is really the why. This is an efficiency move. We've done a, a, a pilot test with seven processes earlier this year in our shared service operation in Parkersburg. And you see the data there, um, you know, incredible performance. Uh, you know, everything that we'd expected from, from RPA has, has proved to be true. But now I want to sort of identify the issue we're wrestling with now. And this was talked about earlier uh, from Department of Interior. The challenge we're facing with RPA, and I think this is the problem that we all will face, how do you keep those bots fully utilized? How do you stack up the work so that that bot that did eight hours of work in 45 minutes, how do you keep that bot performing fully, fully utilized for eight or perhaps 24 hours? And that, I think, is becoming more of an organizational problem than a technical one. How do you align work processes to maybe break down silos so that you can stack up perhaps accounting work and HR work and perhaps procurement work to stack up the work to keep the bot fully occupied. So that's really where we are now in, in that technology and, and these are lessons that we want to share kind of across the landscape. So that's robotics, data analytics. We've talked a lot about that. Uh, the, the problem we're trying to solve here, again, also in the efficiency area. Uh, depending on the measure, you know, tens of billions of dollars are, are probably uh, improperly paid for one reason or another, a whole bunch of definitional issues there, but some portion of that is due to fraud and misstatement. Now, can we use data analytics to address that problem? And we're, we're really focusing data analytics on two, two areas of work. Eligibility screening, how can we run a payment file against uh, a do not pay or it's a do not pay type database and have the matching be effective. Okay, and the second thing is, are there patterns in these payments that really give you a red flag that suggest that payment should not be made? And I think by now everyone's probably familiar with these two programs that, that we're working on at Treasury, the do not pay, I mentioned that earlier, and uh, one you might not be familiar with, and, and that's what goes on in our, our Philadelphia operation, which is the post-payment center. You know, Treasury does about 85% of all federal payments. That, that works out to about 1.2 billion payments a year, about 20 million a week. We have the opportunity in, in building out this post-payment capability to look at cases where multiple payments perhaps could be going to the same location or the same bank account for multiple people. So we begin to see patterns. But the data analytic challenge here is how do we minimize the number of false positives in both of these cases? Because when you're running 20 million payments a week, a false positive becomes a drain on workload that draws attention away from probably the fraudulent case you should be looking at. So this is a case where real heavy data science, I think, could, could yield to better performance in both of these areas. And this is going to be a focus area. And again, I think it's going to be a very fruitful one. Distributed ledger technology. Let me, because I work for Treasury, I always have to caveat this one right up front. This is distributed ledger technology in a closed network, in a closed network. <coughs> Not an open network with miners and cryptocurrencies and all those other things that are very scary. This is just distributed ledger in a closed network between two known parties. And I think the problem that 
DLT could be a good solution to is this, this area of work reconciliation. Think of all the reconciliations we do in the federal landscape. You know, reconciling detailed transactions deep at a, at a bureau or an office level and rolling them all the way up to a general ledger at the top of the federal government. A very hierarchical process which large percent of the work is actually just reconciling detail to general ledger at various steps along the way. DLT is a network-based solution that really changes the paradigm on how you could do reconciliation. And so for that reason, it's worth looking at. But again, I think we have to be realistic. This is a very new technology and one where I think it's not fully understood and its capabilities really have to be exercised before we, we invest heavily in it. But uh, one thing we did to learn more about it was actually conduct a pilot test, a very, uh, kind of a very narrow pilot test reconciling physical inventories using a blockchain. And that is um, one of the most uh, difficult things to maintain in physical inventory is everybody's smartphone, every government employee's smartphone. So what we did was for a very small office actually embed an app on the smartphone and have that app transmit to a blockchain in the cloud and we actually monitored uh, the activity on smartphones with the blockchain and used blockchain to, to reconcile. So we always had a, a, an ongoing inventory of the physical asset, the smartphone, using blockchain. Again, this was, was not to develop a inventory system, but this was just to learn the, the challenges of blockchain. But what we found is we, we enabled essentially real-time inventory, took all the manual process out of the exercise, and um, really discovered the power of blockchain when applied appropriately. But now let me put the, put the caveat on this. Um, the one thing we also discovered as we begin to move this into limited production is around standards and governance. That this, because this is a new technology, there really are no standards in place. And if we move to any kind of interagency type solution using blockchain, I think we've got to make sure that the standards and the governance is in place. So I think it's, it's going to be a while before those are in place. But again, a, a very promising technology if applied appropriately. And one where I think all of us in financial management should keep an eye on this technology because I think it, it has enormous potential uh, if applied properly. Um, common authentication. Um, you think of all the, the citizen-facing applications, again, looking just within Treasury but probably government-wide, citizen-facing applications where the citizen has to authenticate, has to prove who they are. In, in all cases, that authentication process is probably different for each application. I know in Treasury it is. You might use our pay.gov application. The authentication there is different than it is, say, on, on when you file your, your taxes, or very different than when you use our, our invoicing solution. Authentication is different in each of those cases. So are there ways to develop a uniform experience, a uniform way of authenticating that would have two benefits? It would streamline the customer experience and it also would, would, would really cut down an operating cost by creating a single instance of an authentication layer. So common authentication, not easy to solve um, when we're dealing with the legacy systems we are. Um, and again, here's sort of a notional idea I think the graphic is blurry there because I think our concept is still uh, being formed. But imagine if you could offer the citizen a variety of ways using commercial providers to authenticate. And they could use that sort of standard approach to authenticate for not just one but multiple systems at the same time. You could streamline the whole process. This is, is going to take, a, I think, a number of years because we're dealing with very large legacy systems but an approach that uses the beginnings of you know, credential service providers available in the commercial sector that would produce you know, improvements in customer service as well as improvements in efficiency and security. 
standards and common processes. You know, we, we tend to talk about standards and, and, and that sort of thing and documentation, and it, it doesn't sound as exciting as something as blo like blockchain or data analytics. And I think we've got to change our mindset. I, I think with all of the innovations we have out there, the social media, um, collaborative software, let's think of really creative and innovative ways to work together. Ways we can communicate common processes across the whole federal landscape so that we, we move in a common direction. We, we share our ideas in ways that move us in a common direction and we share our solutions. So think about standards and common processes as an, innovate, an opportunity to innovate. Um, you probably noticed in the FIT office we've been using social media a fair amount, LinkedIn. I mean, it's not for self-promotion. It's really to try to use some of these new avenues to communicate common solutions. Uh, one thing we've done that I, I, I do think does not get recognized enough is uh, really with the, the support of OMB and, and others, developed common use cases defining federal financial management. And they're, they're out there at that URL. Uh, frankly, if you just Google uh, federal financial management use cases, you'll go to the site. There's not a lot of use for those keywords. Um, and you really have there documented end-to-end -end processes for the core 11 financial management processes. It breaks them down to inputs, outputs, and processes, what's being done, and then breaks it down further to individual use cases. And I think, you know, in time, this could become a structure for thinking about federal financial management in a common framework, a common way of using our words to communicate common processes. So, and again, I, I think this is, is, is a little bit underappreciated. I think we, we could do a better job communicating it. But I, again, I think the beginning of a framework for talking about financial management. So those are the five innovations. Um, and let me end kind of where I began, which is why are we doing this? Um, and and I, I think it's, it's for this reason. That, you know, every day, millions of Americans have a financial interaction with the government. They're, you know, they're, 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 they're paying a fee. They're perhaps receiving a benefit payment. They're getting financial information. They're, they're, they're finding out the T-bill rate, a lot of things like that. And, you know, their expectations are these. You know, they expect that, you know, the government's an efficient steward. They expect that the data that we provide is accurate, and they expect that the interaction should be modern, seamless, and secure. So it's, it's sort of these public expectations are the ones that are really drove us, certainly at Treasury, to, to identify these five innovations that we're going to stay true to for the next couple of years. I have nine minutes left, but that was very intentional so that you can have questions or to allow Tim Saltis to come up and, and do his presentation because I know he's got some very important things to cover and I don't want to cut into his time. But uh, any, any quick questions? Good, so I, I don't have to explain blockchain. Thank you. Oh, thank you, John.